Mansfield's um, public talks and um, Professor Alida Black. Um, one of the things that I care about very much and Mansfield is about is about finding and reflecting and examining voices which might not otherwise enter um, political consciousness and public discourse. And that's why I am so pleased that the first of the public talks which I ever introduced nervously four years ago um, in my first day in this role was um, Professor Alida Black um, talking about Eleanor Roosevelt the day that our honorary fellow, um, Senator uh, Hillary Clinton, unveiled our statue of Eleanor Roosevelt, which had arrived by crane um, two or three days before. Um, Alida is a distinguished visiting scholar at the Miller Center for Public Affairs and also affiliated to the Georgetown Institute for Women, uh, Peace and Security. And she established Allenwood Group, which is a collaborative which is intended to preserve and document women's political history and to strengthen, um, ed strengthen democracy through education and civic engagement. Again, that resonates very strongly with us, and we're delighted she's here. Um, a leader is the leading expert. Uh, my note says a leading expert, and she's the leading expert on Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, and she's also um, currently working on, uh, as, as the official historian uh, for Senator uh, Rodham Clinton. She's also worked for Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the president of Liberia, and Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, a leader asked me to say that she um, is inexpert in using history to solve policy problems, but I think um, that Madam Sirleaf Johnson and Sen Senator Clinton might not agree. But she's going to talk to us today about um, the challenge of resurrecting human rights in the shadow of war, which is sadly about as topical as it can get, but we are very delighted to welcome you here and um, back here. Thank you, Alida. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody, and to uh, my friends that showed up to give me moral support to, uh, to come here. I'm, I'm delighted to be back at Bonavero, which to me is one of the great wonders of the world. And the fact that it is here in an institution that is a 1,000 years old and yanks that institution into uh, current crises in honorable and deliberative ways is uh, something that I found uh, to be indescribably important. And, um, you know, I just, I just can't say enough about you, Kate. You know, what, what you have done here is just really monumental. You know, I, I just, and my friend Helen, you know, who runs this whole place and keeps it going and has the vision and the energy to integrate everything. Um, it's, it's just a joy to stand here and support you in your efforts to really elevate and preserve and expand Mansfield. So thank you very, very much. Uh, having started with that great note, I'm going to begin with a real downer. And that is, as we approach the 75th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as you all know, the world confronts a global pandemic, rampant inflation, resurgent nationalism, infectious illiberalism, political purity tests, climate instability, a refugee crisis, and the looming threat of a nuclear attack. So much so that human rights are now marginalized to the extent that the Declaration often seems irrelevant, if not dormant. This is a dire, blunt portrait, especially in these halls that are developed to put the Declaration to work. But, but, Despite claims to the contrary, it is not an unprecedented crisis. What is ahistorical now is the way we are responding to these crises, how we use these inflexible, siloed anxieties and dogmas to undermine a common determination that really underpins and empowers the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. How at a moment when the world is so integrated 
you know, when it's more connected than ever through trade and media. We cling to sovereignty and we, su we succumb to virulent inner Nicene culture wars. And to my great heart sickness, an elite vocabulary word, we allow zealots to dominate public conversations. But history shows us this was not the case. So how did we get to this watershed moment, Raya? Um, you know, where can those, what can those of us who believe in human rights do to resurrect the vision and the power that the Declaration gives us? This question has haunted me for the past couple of years, and I readily confess I don't have the answer. But I do have the stamina and the determination to try and the craziness to stand here at Oxford in the well of Bonavero to ask for help. Hence this mediation in the front of all of you who dedicate yourself to this task. Perhaps if we ask how we got here, we will at least assume some sense or have some sense of what we must do to sustain and implement the Declaration, to make it a call to action rather than a staid historical document. Because it's the individuals, it's we as individuals, who bear the responsibility to care. It is individuals who shape government policy. Because, as Eleanor says, we cannot leave our problems to the government. We are the government. Thus, a brief historical recap is necessary. And with apologies to all the Oxonians in the room who want to begin this talk with Cyrus the Great, I am going to leap ahead to 1946 and talk about the battle to construct the Declaration itself. In shorthand, I want to talk about Eleanor's declaration, the declaration in the aftermath of the Second World War. Two conflicting emotions governed the, the Second World War, the post-war world, fear and hope. Fear of a return to an unimaginable global conflagration a worldwide atomic confrontation even more violent and destructive than the Second World War. Fear that a long-lasting, global, intense depression on top of the economic havoc that the Second World War inflicted would crush the hard-worn peace. But on the other hand, hope that the people of the world could not only acknowledge their common humanity, but that nations might create an organization that would perpetuate peace for the foreseeable future. Hope that governments who had won the war would, in fact, as Eleanor Roosevelt hoped, win the peace. In some fear and hope dominated the world debates that gave birth both to the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in both, hope won out. Case in point, in late 1946, shrouded in the shadow of a catastrophic world war that invaded all parts of the globe, nine delegates selected for their individual expertise gathered at Hunter College to discuss what actions the four-month-old United Nations could take to advance what it called, quote, universal respect for and, ob and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms. It was a daunting, unprecedented task. This small nuclear or preparatory committee had no legal precedence to guide it, and no benchmarks on which to base its work. Although the UN Charter adopted the previous June began with an unequivocal 
reaffirmation of faith and fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women in nations large and small. It had simultaneously, as you all know, declared its commitment to domestic jurisdiction and national sovereignty. This irony could not be overlooked. As the Nuclear Committee convened in Manhattan, they understood that they had been handed a Herculean task. The nascent General Assembly had not been able to define human rights or reconcile them with national sovereignty. Instead, it adopted resolutions highlighting the importance of economic and social justice and the need for an International Bill of Rights while providing little, if any, guidance on what those rights should be or how they might be codified, promoted, and protected. Instead, the General Assembly passed that critical work to this nine-member nuclear committee. The nuclear committee's delegates represented nations that had come together solely to battle the Germans and the Japanese. Yet they remained divided over distinct political, economic, cultural, and religious beliefs. Despite these differences, none could sideline the lingering nightmare of war. What do I mean? 15 million soldiers killed in battle. 25 million soldiers wounded, 45 million civilians wounded, more than 6 million murdered and tortured in concentration camps, and 50 plus million citizens scattered across wretched refugee camps. The battles themselves lingered in their consciousness. The firebombing of Dresden, the London Blitz, Stalingrad, the Battle of the Bulge, the Philippines, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, and the unforeseeable terror of the atomic bomb. And all of this horror occurs less than 25 years after the first great war, the first world war that introduced poison gas, the war that was designed to end all wars but instead resulted in a failed peace, the war that was to make the world safe for democracy, but instead gave rise to a race-based tyranny. The war that jump-started the Great Depression, which ricocheted around the world and provoked yet another world war in its wake. The fear was unavoidable and unmistakable. It would have been easy to slip into the retribution mode and create a document that prioritized local values rather than establish a global vision. But within three years, over more than 300 meetings that lasted over 3,000 hours, the unimaginable happened. The 18 nations that formed the first UN Commission on Human Rights, who did not agree on government, what the responsibility of government was, who citizens were, whether God existed or not, whether private property existed or not, whether women were people in their own right, whether children were young individuals or young workers. We could go on and on. They began their deliberations with nothing in common. They only believed that by God they beat the Germans. But they overcame their intensely held political, economic, religious, and cultural differences to find common cause against war and oppression. Why? All understood the extent to which the Declaration's individual articles 
were fashioned intellectually as a response to the specific policies and practices implemented by the Nazis and other fascists, and emotionally as an expression of the collective fear that such policies might resurface, if not guarded against with the utmost vigor. This meant the United States abandoned its opposition to economic, social, and cultural rights, parenthetically, thanks to Eleanor Roosevelt's recruitment of a conservative Catholic Republican to go threaten dual resignations before the Secretary of State. The Nazis agreed not to block political and civil rights because Eleanor Roosevelt met at least a dozen times with each individual member of the Soviet bloc delegation, including their chauffeurs and kitchen staff. Men and women were recognized as equal beings under the law, thanks to Han Sameda of India. Christians and Jews had to recognize other faiths existed, and former colonizing nations had to treat, albeit begrudgingly, their former colonies as sovereign nations. But perhaps even more relevant to today's climate, delegates refused to let the politics of the Cold War and the bomb sideline a new vision of governance that was possible and worth striving for. One where race-based laws would be challenged and eventually negated. Refugees would not be pawns in a geopolitical chess match. Education would be as seen as essential as, to, as essential to life as water, health care, and income and food. Torture and cruel and unusual treatment would be censured and prohibited. And political and people could speak out and organize without fear. Hope, in short, became an antidote to fascism, fear, and reaction. As Eleanor Roosevelt and her human rights colleagues strove to promote courage, Eleanor insisted, is more exhilarating than fear, and in the long run, it is easier. All we have to have is the courage to look in the mirror and take one step at a time. So let's jump 50 years later. Let's jump to Hillary Clinton's generation. The generation that founded the Beijing Platform for Action. By the early 1990s, the Berlin Wall had fallen. The Cold War had ended. Wars were now more localized and more intimately violent. Increasingly, rape had become a weapon of war. In Rwanda, the Congo, Liberia, Bosnia, Croatia, and dozens of other nations. Drugged on brown, brown, and haunted by memories of family slaughter. Children became soldiers and sex slaves in Colombia, Ecuador, Sierra Leone, Uganda, and at least a dozen other nations. The Taliban had seized power in Afghanistan. Nationalists and unionists continued to fight in the streets of Belfast. AIDS had become a global scourge. Russia had invaded Chechnya, and in the United States, a domestic terrorist bombed a local, a bombed a government building in Oklahoma City. But Movements were on the rise, and movements that would change the course of the world. By 1970, women had pressured the United Nations to hold world conferences on women and led the effort to draft and pass the covenant to end discrimination against women. The racial disparities that permeated the early feminist movement began to subside after open and frank conversations occurred consistently with intensity and candor. Although difficult discussions of sexuality and gender 
once swept under the carpet, arose in community and international gatherings, progress could not be discounted. By the 1980s, South African blacks and their white allies had led a world movement to end apartheid, culminating in Nelson Mandela's election, at Nelson Mandela's release from prison and his election as president. Gay men and their lesbian, transgendered and straight allies formed organizations that acted up to fight AIDS, formed local health clinics, legal defense funds, and launched court cases that would change America and international law. The Irish Republican Army declared a ceasefire. Human rights were now part of these vocabularies, and they had moved from ideals to concrete action. In many quarters, awareness as awareness of violations increased, commitments to address them intensified in both the private and public spaces, grounded in an awareness of and an obligation to our common humanity. In 1973, 7,000 people from 171 nations gathered in Vienna for the first World Conference on Human Rights. Although the platforms had been carefully negotiated beforehand so that individual nations and individual violations could not be sanctioned, people were determined to leave with concrete results. No group was more organized at this conference than the global women who attended it. They organized in 181 nations to secure for the first time specific references to the rights of women and girls. Their work produced Article 7 of the Vienna Platform, which declared, and I quote, the human rights of women and the girl child are inalienable. They are integral and an invisible part of universal human rights. The full and equal participation of women in political, civil, economic, and cultural life at the national, international levels and the eradication of all forms of discrimination on the grounds of sex are priority objectives of the international community. Armed with this framework, fortified by their vision, and determined to launch an effective global movement, one that would fortify and protect individuals and hold governments accountable, more than 45 thousand women and men, more than six times the number of delegates in Vienna, and three times the number of delegates at the Nairobi Conference on Women convened in and around Beijing. Yes, in China, whose human rights record the U.S. and other Western nations loved to criticize. By 1995, China was on its way to becoming a dominant force in the world economy, a major player in international trade, and an aggressive investor in Africa and Latin America. If the Cold War had ended, the China rivalry was, in fact, escalating. Many in the U.S. Congress, including Nancy Pelosi, objected to an American delegation traveling to China. China had just arrested human rights activist and expatriate Harry Wu after he re-entered China and falsely accused him of espionage. Using Wu as hostage in a political football, liberals in the American Congress argued that, in fact, the American delegation should not go to China. Leading Republicans told 
the press that the conference was, quote, shaping up as an unsanctioned festival of anti-family, anti-American values. The Vatican strongly objected to discussions of sexuality and reproduction. Governments linked, governments linked to Sharia law objected across the board. And as if the tension in the United States wasn't high enough, for the first time, the U.S. delegation would be headed by a woman who happened to be the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, who happened to be the first woman to hold that post, who happened to be the outspoken Madeleine Albright. It happened to be co-chaired by the first lady of the United States, who happened to be the outspoken Hillary Rodham Clinton, who many pundits characterized as the living war shot test for women around the world. The world press and the international women's rights community followed these developments closely. China grew equally nervous, concerned that thousands of activists attending the parallel NGO forum would challenge human rights policy. The government relocated the forum from Beijing to 35 miles out Beijing to uh, the High Road District. This separation, however, energized rather than isolated the attendees. And together, the official delegates and the NGO activists strove to produce a grounded declaration and a clear policy-oriented platform for action. Yet, again, reaching consensus involved intense negotiations. Previous UN declarations and platforms had been carefully negotiated in advance by the governments. And the delegates attending the conference, while they could tweak them some, more frequently served as a rubber stamp to declarations that had been previously agreed upon by the participating governments. The Beijing conference operated under a different set of rules. While governments had a role, the delegates and the NGO activists would have the final say. As planning sessions intensified, governments got increasingly anxious. So did the different sides of the White House. Hillary Clinton told her chief of staff that she was determined to attend even if it meant attending as an individual and to get her her own ticket on a commercial airline and an individual non-government passport. Some of the president's advisors worried that her attendance so soon after the failed health care plan, the health care reform efforts, and its catastrophic impact on the 1994 midterms would tee up yet another anti-Hillary tirade that would tank the president's chances for re-election in 1996. But China folded and released Wu, and Hillary, Hillary went to China as first lady and co-chair of the delegation. Although she had been working on her remarks for almost a year, prior to Beijing, while somewhere over the Pacific, she turned to Lisa Muscatine, a Rhodes Scholar, by the way, and said she wanted her remarks to push the envelope as far as humanly possible. Lissa and Hillary Clinton convened on the airplane. There's draft after draft after draft after draft. By the time Hillary Clinton takes the stage in Beijing, the attendees, already harassed by police, grew more determined to leave with a concrete plan of action, a policy roadmap that both applied to their countries and gave them the moral courage and the cover 
that they needed to, to continue their work without risking their lives consistently. In a speech that reverberated around the world, Hillary Clinton threw her unquestioned support behind the conference. For too long, she declared, the history of women has been a history of silence. Even today, there are those who are trying to silence our words. The voice of this conference and of the women at high row must be heard loud and clear. After denouncing human trafficking, female genital mutilation, specific violent acts against women, and the denial of women's rights to plan their own families, she concluded, if there is one message that echoes forth from this conference, let it be that human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights once and for all. The delegates agreed. Citing the UN Charter, the UDHR, CEDA, and other conventions, the government signing, the government signing the Beijing Declaration affirmed women's rights are human rights and pledged themselves as governments to implement the platform for action and ensure, quote, that a gender perspective is related and reflected in all of our policies and all of our governments. But reaching that consensus again revolved, involved intense con negotiations and compromise. Objections to Planck supporting women's right to abortion and family planning as well as rights related to sexuality and gender identity threatened to sabotage the conference. But the delegation and their NGO lobbyists remained at the table, and they worked to craft a vision that launched the global women's human rights movement, whose principles would define global policies for the next two decades. This 223-page platform for action, coupled with CEDA and the Vienna Declaration, defined the contemporary women's human rights agenda. It identified 12 critical areas of interest, poverty, education, and training, health, violence against women, as well as establishing rules governing women in armed conflict, conflict women in the economy, women in power and decision-making, women in the media, women in the environment, the status of the girl child, and listed objectives and recommended actions to improve women's access to rights in these areas. So what am I trying to say here? The Beijing Declaration, I'm sorry, the Beijing Platform like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is a declaration, not a covenant, and therefore carries no legal power. However, as governments who signed the platform pledged themselves to act, the declaration did and continues to carry great moral weight in real pragmatic terms. When the governments that adopted the platform, when governments adopted the platform, they committed themselves, quote, to addressing the obstacles to the advancement and empowerment of women, close quote. As the Center for Women's Global Leadership notes, the platform for action still serves as the policy guide for governments, institutions, private businesses, and UN agencies and establishes standards by which to judge policies and promote programs already in place. In short, Beijing not only capitalized and catapulted a global women's movement, it also compelled nations to act. 98 countries have adopted their own platform for action. 
and every five years, the women of the world reconvene to reassess their progress. Beijing plus five, Beijing plus 10, Beijing plus 15, Beijing plus 20, Beijing plus 25. In short, this is a platform with legs. Beijing compelled the UN to act. Its third millennial development goal directed its members to take measurable action to, quote, promote gender equality and empower women. The Security Council adopted Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security, 1820 on sexual violence and conduct, conflict, 1888 on protecting women and girls from sexual violence in conduct, and 1899 on monitoring efforts to reinforce Resolution 1325. The UN Foundation made women and population one of its four international priorities. In 2015, the UN adopted sustainable development goals that committed its member states to, quote, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, close quote. And in 2020, Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez declared that gender equality and the rights of women were one of the UN's seven guiding principles. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to argue that the UDHR and the Beijing Platform for Action moved us from articulating a vision that could withstand the horrors of war and virulent discrimination to a worldwide women's movement that translated these ideals into concrete policies with their own political rallying cry. Change did occur, though not at the levels idealists hoped for, but change did occur. The UN had finally committed, had, um, had created a high commissioner for human rights in 1993 and in 1997 appointed the indomitable Mary Robinson and now Michelle Bachelet to lead it with focus and vigor. Market women in Liberia ended a 14-year civil war and elected Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first democratically elected woman to lead an African nation. Government and military leaders of the Rwandan genocide the former Yugoslavia, Argentina, the Sudan, the Ivory Coast, and were, were, uh, were, sorry, are tried for crimes against humanity, war crimes, or genocide. The International Criminal Court brings charges against East Timor, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, Peru, Guatemala, and last year, 23 countries reformed their laws to promote women's economic rights. So where are we now, 26 years after Beijing and 74 years after the Declaration? The world faces many of the same challenges it faced when Eleanor Roosevelt and her colleagues dared to create the Declaration of Human Rights and Hillary Clinton and the women of the world dared to force the world to see that women's rights are human rights once and for all. The shadow of a nuclear bomb hangs over us still. War grounded in nationalism threatens to permeate Europe. Inflation and a vulnerable global supply chain threaten the world's economy. The post-war military and eco economic alliances that are now resurging are still vulnerable if, in fact, military intervention is required. And gender equality and the rights of women and girls are still the unfinished business of this century. But rather than build on this record, and take courage from those 
who risked all they had to build this platform and gird up for this long-standing struggle, a struggle essential to interpreting and advancing human rights. The world now seems trapped in a political quagmire where millions of citizens around the world are ensnared in a quicksand determined to push each other down to keep their heads above the life-sucking muck. At times when the world faces this watershed moment, the global pandemic has not subsided despite our most fervent imaginings. Poverty, which was decreasing, is now on the rise. Democracy and civic conversations of all forms are now under attack and its opponents are winning the battle. American politics are polarized, compromised, discarded, party purity litmus test imposed on candidates and policy. And the Supreme Court undermines the right to privacy. Social media, rather than informed reporting, interprets world events, and human rights have either been limited to political and civil rights deferred and defined solely by national interests or gravely undermined by purity tests. Let me give you four examples that terrify me. First, Afghanistan. We tell women and the men and children who support them that if they risk their lives, all and the lives of their families and those they love, to build a more just nation, we will stand with them. Where are we now? The Taliban is back. Girls' education and women's right to work and vote are truncated. A famine threatens to wipe out significant parts of its population, and thousands and thousands of women who followed our plea are stuck in refugee camps in Albania, Pakistan, and other places confined by visas we will not issue. Second, the Ukraine. This is not just a primal battle to save a sovereign nation. It has become a place, in the United States at least, where human rights emerge only in political and civil terms, all connected to a conversation grounded in war crimes. Third, climate change. I had lunch last Sunday with a former student who I treasure almost more than anybody in the world. I used to say I could leave the classroom because I was the one that taught her. And I am still convinced that one day she will win the Nobel Peace Prize. But as we sat across from each other at Sunday brunch, and I say to her, and she's an Oxonian, Swathi, I'm going to Oxford. I'm going to Bonavero, you know. I'm going to do this. You know, and Swathi and I worked side by side for four years. She was my right hand, my soul in the Eleanor Papers. I mean, she came to me the day after 9-11, and she stayed for four years, never wavering. You know, and, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm in this quandary, Swathi. I, you know, I've got to get my hope back. I've got to figure out how we can fight this. And she turns across the table, and she looks at me, and she says, Alita, human rights don't exist anymore. They're predicated on, the predicated on the belief that all human beings are equal. The world does not acknowledge that. The pressing issue of our time is climate change. Climate is the real emergency. 
if we do not address this, if we do not focus all our energies on this and the right to safe water, poverty and famine will lead to successive world wars. I cannot tell you how that pierced my heart. Fourth, the status of women. According to the World Bank Women's Business and the Law Report of this year, almost 2.4 billion women of working age are not afforded economic opportunity, and 178 countries maintain legal barriers that prevent their full economic participation. Women in 86 nations face some form of job restrictions, and 95 countries do not guarantee equal pay for equal work. Globally, women still have only three quarters of the legal rights afforded to men. These four and many more pressing I can name convince me that we have allowed anger and fear to sideline hope. That we have allowed the vision of hope the vision of human rights, the power of struggle to be co-opted by those who believe that they are better than the rest. We have allowed anxiety and piety to govern our civic consciousness. That's a damning quartet. I admit I'm very worried. And I have no idea how to combat that other than to stand here and beg for help and to do the following things. To raise my voice and to stand with those who dare to make human rights real, as Kate O'Regan has done her entire flipping life. To strive to work with those whose policies I oppose, but who have the courage to sit with me and talk to form alliances with those with whom I mostly disagree, but whose support of issues dear to me can help advance change and perhaps lead to further working relationships. And most importantly of all, here at Bonavero in Oxford, to plead for a new language, a new tone, grounded in a vision that we can all share that celebrates our common humanity in ways that override political vitriol. I believe in Bonavero with all I am. I believe in the Declaration with all I am. I believe in my friends who have survived torture horrific wars, alienation, torture, the fiercest loneliness imaginable, but who have the courage to reclaim life, who have the courage to reclaim joy, who have the courage to say life does not have to be this way. So if we do not have to, if we don't figure out how to have this conversation in real terms, in language clear to the world, despite nationality, religion, politics, and level of education, we are absent without leave in this war. We will have turned our back on the values and visions we espouse and the declaration will simply be words on paper. I have no doubt that we can do this. The history of the Declaration in Beijing show that we can change the world. I refuse to abandon this fight. I am convinced that we can do this if, if we focus on what unites us rather than what divides us. And if we heed Eleanor Roosevelt's call to look ourselves in the mirror and take one step at a time. If we do that, 
hope once again will supplant fear. Thank you for your attention, and I really look forward to learning from you and hearing how strongly you disagree with me. So I really um, thank you for coming, and um, I salute you all for what you do. Oh my God, now I'm really nervous. You should see the notes that, no. <laughs> that, that Helen took. Well, Alida, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, very inspiring and um, fitting. Okay, now as I'm well. going to make a fool of myself. I'm just you're, telling you. You're not, look, because I'm going to pull you some. Oh, see, this host. is why she's my friend. There we are. The host okay. the most. There we are. Um, and, and I think reminding us of why we need to look at the history of how declarations came about if we're going to inform current policy, but I was very struck um, by what you said as a, 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 a plea for a new language and a new tone. And this is very pertinent um, in a university mm -hmm. where I think there are people who think, who feel rightly perhaps that the people who are oppressed by lack of human rights are the ones who are called upon to change their tone and to make the compromises. And there's a sense, I think there's a new politics of, well, we won't change our tone. You change your tone for us. How are we going to have these conversations? We uh, just got to keep having them. Mm. I mean, it's, um, okay, Judy's going to kill me, but we have this fight mm. every day in our house, mm. okay? Because she is just ballistic. And we'll just go on diatribes to get a certain political party, you know. And I, while I have mortgaged my house, quit my job, and spent, you know, seven years of my life campaigning against that party, um, I refuse to believe that every person in that party is a blood-sucking leech. You know, and and so we've got. I'll give you I'll give you an example. I have um, I'm on the board of a campaign school at Yale that was formed to elect women to go to Congress and to help to, to, well federal office and to um, encourage people to run effective campaigns for women. It's issue neutral and bipartisan, and I'm the Democratic judge. And the Republican judge is the woman who was the most recent director of the Republican Senatorial Committee. We disagree on 70% of things, but we have a common belief that we must put women in office and that if, in fact, women are in office, that we can sit and hammer things out. In the middle of the pandemic, um, I was trying to uh, support, Judy and I were trying to support a dear friend of ours who is a torture survivor in Chicago who was working three minimum wage consecutive jobs on COVID floors in elder care facilities. And each job, each week for each company, the agency took a cut from her pay she had to work 19 hours a day to pay her rent. And none of the agencies gave her protective material. I called half of the Democratic people I knew who were leaders to say, can you, in fact, get a rule put into this piece of legislation that, in fact, gave elder care facilities PPE, so they wouldn't die, okay? The only person that responded to my call was my friend, the Republican. And she said to me, I do politics, I don't do, po I don't do policy, but I trust you, tell me what I need to say. We have got to figure out how to build those alliances. You know, if we don't, we're going to be crazy. You know, we're just not going to get anything done and we're going to spin and spin and spin 
and nothing's going to happen. I mean, I want the world to be fabulous. I want everybody to be safe. I want every gender in the history of the universe to recognize. Do I care that, the, you know, that a term has 27 letters on the end of it? No, and I've been out since 1971 and will put my gay politics up against anybody at Oxford's. You know, how are we going to get past this? And, you know, I was just, we just got, we just can't take the bait. Okay, now I'm going to open this up. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. Question. That's why I'm here. You first, guys got to so Who's going to um, start us off with a question? Any other questions? We have microphones here. I can see a hand there. If you just wait for the microphone and then right. we can hear you. What's your name? Uh, my name's Michael Payne. Nice uh, to meet you. Well, likewise. Uh, optimists may think that the uh, number of Republicans, like the friend you just mentioned, may increase over the next few years and, and healthier dialogue between the parties can result. But the Supreme Court, I think, is not going to change very much for quite some time. And the Supreme Court may be about to overturn... Will. Ro Rome Wade. Not about to. Will. Um, so what about the future of um, human rights, women's rights in, in the States over the next 10 or 20 well, years? Well, I, I, we were talking about that earlier today at, at Rothamere. Um, I just don't think it's women's rights, just women's rights. I think that's the tipping point. I think it's um, gay marriage. I think it's interracial marriage. I think it's every decision that is grounded in privacy. And the only way to combat this effectively right now um, is to organize in the states as though your life depends on it and not assume that your state legislatures will, in fact, adhere to the laws that they passed. You know, if we get into a fight over the filibuster, if we get into a fight over packing the court, if, in fact, we make this a fight just about abortion, um, the despair, the, the Democrats will get creamed in the midterms because the Democrats can't win unless we stop the hemorrhaging in the black vote and the Hispanic vote. And there is, all the data shows that there is... Um, questioning of the right to abortion more significantly in those two communities than there are in the other communities in the United States. So we have got to talk about this as what it is, which is massive government interference in the lives of individual citizens that has long lasting ramifications way beyond reproduction. It's who you can love, when you can marry, um, who is going to control. How is this going to, how is the, the revocation of privacy going to affect data? How is it going to affect AI? This is a landmark decision that once again is on the backs of women and uses women you know, as, as the, the root to put in um, the most anti-human rights agenda possible. Did that answer your question? No. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, I mean, I'm a pessimist on this, but I mean, I am really happy to be proven, on, proven wrong on this. Um, I have a, a, a young friend who is a beloved mentee who is running for the Senate um, in um, Wisconsin who will take out one of the most conservative senators in the United States Senate if Sarah wins. And Sarah is convinced, just convinced, that this is the tipping point that she needs to take out Ron Johnson because she is the only person in the race who's been saying for the last six months that, you know, he's anti-choice and the court's going to overturn Roe. So, you know, I hope Sarah proves me wrong. I want her to win more than anything in the world. So. Anyone else got a question for Linda or an observation? 
oh, come on, you guys have to disagree with me. <laughs> There's a hand at the back there. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Finn. I go to Mansfield College, so it's lovely to see you here. Um, I was wondering, you talked obviously a lot about the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. What do you think the, the potential role of international organizations, particularly something like the United Nations, which is still heavily peppered by like inequalities, if you think about the Security Council and veto powers, which have obstructed so many decisions to be made, what the kind of future roles that those kind of organizations can play in kind of filling human rights when they still have those kind of elements of large inequalities, particularly in representation of people that have been marginalized in even forming the Declaration of Human Rights and stuff? The United Nations was created for this moment. And if the United Nations doesn't come together to deal with Ukraine, there is not gonna be a United Nations. And I do not think that the only person that can represent me is a white, southern, failed debutante lesbian with a PhD who loves women's basketball and Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. You know, I believe that um, my friend Michael Cooper can speak for me anytime, anywhere in the world. Ellen Johnson Trelief can speak for me anytime in the world. Hillary Clinton can speak for me anytime in the world. We have got to figure out how to bust out of these purity silos that we put ourselves in. If we continue to do that, at a time when we need to be coming together to figure out all of this stuff, if we keep putting ourselves in boxes, it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. I wanna set measurable goals that we can stand on. You know, I'll give you a very personal example that since I'm at Oxford, it can be intellectual. Um, I'm passionately um, engaged in the history of Eleanor Roosevelt's life, okay? God save me from liberal white men who automatically want to read something and say that Eleanor had a sexual relationship with Lorena Hickok to show that they are flipping cool. Okay. And it's that same look at me attitude, look how sensitive I am, rather than saying, okay, look at what this woman encountered. Look at her life. Look at the alliances she built. Look how she risked her life. Look at the 17 assassination attempts she survived. Look at how she risked her income. And for God's sake, look at what she did with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I want to figure out how we can find common ground and allow each other to be who we are without tearing each other down and second guessing us all the time. You know, if we do that, you know, Eleanor would say that the reason that she um, uh, had to abandon creating an international bill of rights rather than the declaration no disrespect intended, is that lawyers would spend three years negotiating on where to place a comma. We would lose the UN, you know, we would, Truman would lose the election in 48, and we would have no vision. She was right. It took 25 years to get the covenant. I want to figure out how we can build on that in a way that is um, building alliances that are frank and where differences are allowed without destroying each other. And until we figure that out, we're toast. And right now, 
both cultural politics, the politics of human rights, and God knows the politics of the United States are defined by that. And we're going to go backwards because of it. And I don't want to go backwards, especially now when all of this other stuff is happening. So I disagree with your premise. Leo, I think the question was about whether a United Nations established as it is with a permanent Security Council, um, two of whose members are not going to unite well, around I, Ukraine, yeah, means I, that the values come we, Well, we have to up challenge it. Politics. You know, and I think that um, I am not a UN specialist, okay, but I think it was absolutely a kick in the groin to the UN that Linda Thomas Greenfield and others negotiated to get the General Assembly to kick Russia off the Human Rights Council. That was a huge step. We have to figure out how to do strategic engagements like that. You know, we've got to figure out how to work around um, the, um, the Security Council in constructive ways, the way that my nation worked around the Security Council in destructive ways. You know, if the United States can figure out how to sideline the Security Council to go into Iraq, surely the members of the Security Council can figure out how to, just, how to resurrect human rights and support Ukraine, you know, without um, um, elevating Russia. I, I, I don't know how to answer that, I'm sorry. I'm, if I can ask a follow-up question? Yeah, um, sure. Very briefly, but I've got Very one briefly. more and then we're going to... Yeah, yeah um, just in reference to that as well, then obviously the representation on the Security Council itself yeah. is in no way representative or conducive to solving those things. Because we talk about, as you said, the UN needs to prove itself in Ukraine currently, but the, UK, but the UN is currently failing in Yemen. The UN has failed in Rwanda and Syria. What's different about the situation in Ukraine? Russia has the bomb and can bomb the shit out of the world. That's the difference. They're dirty bombs. They're bombs that can reach the United Kingdom. They're bombs that can reach France. You know, and I, I mean, am I concerned about Syria? Am I concerned about Libya? Absolutely. But what I am also poorly, obviously, trying to argue is that if we don't look at Ukraine as more than the violation of a sovereign nation, if we don't look at it as beyond war crimes, if we don't look at all of the factors that elevate this situation into a world crisis, um, we are um, um, deflating, or maybe uh, that's not the word I was, sucking the power or the vision out of, um, out of the declaration. And when the, Ukraine, when the war in Ukraine right now is galvanizing the world, um, use it. And use it as a way to prove your point and to build the next step. You know, I mean, there's a great political crook in the United States. His name was George Washington Plunkett. And he founded Tammany Hall, which is one of the great political machines in our history. But he said a great line that I have co-opted. And that is, I seen my opportunities and I took them. And when we can galvanize the world's attention and use it to address common issues that occur across the globe in other countries at risk and in war, then do it. I'm going to take one more from Shreya, actually, very quickly, and then I'm going to draw this to a close. So. Thanks so much, Aleda, for a very passionate talk. Um, I, um, I really resonate with your central message that we have to form alliances and find common ground. So I'm not going to disagree, but perhaps you could tease uh, um, a, a premise on, on which the message is, is centered that we have perhaps not done that. So 
those on the far left would perhaps argue that it isn't that we haven't found common ground, but that perhaps we have found too much of it. I'm thinking of AOC's politics, and I'm thinking of the European Greens here. Yeah. Um, at least the European Greens are different in the sense that they're very committed to finding the common ground, mm -hmm. but they would make that distinction that we cannot find common ground um, with certain kinds of, of, of factions. Uh, perhaps the common ground uh, in, in, say, Chantal Mouffe's language would be, we have to find the grand intersectional left populist movement, and we're gonna do a lot of lo line drawing here. I wonder if, if you think we, that common ground too involves line drawing, and there are certain kinds of deals that, that we can't strike because yeah. good I, politics, progressive sure. politics fails then, yeah. and perhaps that's the moment we're in. Okay, I hope I understand. So um, correct me, please, if I'm wrong. What you are asking, greatly simplified, is that can common ground apply across the board? And no. But there has to be some fundamental common ground that we all have to agree to that can be used as a point of negotiation. You know, I don't say that, the, that we all have to agree on if God exists, you know. I don't say we all have to agree if private property exists, you know. I don't say we all have to agree that a nation should provide X, Y, or Z, or that um, um, militaries should be able to do Y but not do B. But I do think that we have to find some place to begin to discuss, to begin the conversations, to begin the painful conversations that have to happen. And we have to figure out how to do it without taking the bait that we're, that's often thrown at us, you know, and, um, I, I've become um, tangentially involved um, in an organization in Chicago that um, uh, supports torture survivors. And I have gotten to know um, some of the clients um, um, in ways that, I, um, that changed my life. And if they have the courage after what has happened to them to say, I can rebuild a life and try to rebuild my voice in a way that gives voice to hope but also makes me feel safe. If they can do that, why can't all of us in this room who have been safe do that? And if we don't figure that out, we're seduced by own, our own language rather than empowered by our courage. Does that, did that answer your question? Well, Alida, I'm going to let you have a drink now, but thank oh, you God. very much for a really wonderful um, talk and um, engaging um, so fully and generously with the questions. Um, next week, we're shifting subject, um, and we're going to have Sir P Professor Sir Peter Horby who is going to be the head of the Centre for Pandemic Preparedness here um, at Oxford, talking about COVID-19 therapeutics, revelations and revolutions. I've met him. He's a great medic. He's a great public policy thinker. Do come along um, if you want to. But in the meantime, thank you. Um, but can I ask yes. a question and really put myself <laughs> on the spot? Kate, am I wrong? <laughs> Spoken like a true diplomat. <laughs> yes, yes. You can ask her later. <laughs> She's not speaking this week. I'll get her to speak another time. Yeah. But, um, but, but thank you very much for um, reminding me of my famous, fa favourite um, Gramscian quotation: "Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will." Mm -hmm. And let's all go out um, with hope and have a nice weekend. Thank you very much, Alida. Thank you all for coming.